Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you for the uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me to talk a bit about malware as a service. So this is actually a joint piece of research that Josh Strostein and myself did. Um, we're both based in Bromium. Um, of, of course, you probably know Josh more from his work with the OISF. Um, and we work within the threat research team in Bromium Labs. Uh, so just a bit of background about myself. Um, I used to be an instant responder, used to be a SOC analyst, so I've kind of spent Christmas in a SOC once. So I can kind of know what it's like to be in the trenches. Um, I also like to give back to the community, so I'm a co-organizer of B-Sides Bristol. Please come next year as well. We had our inaugural event uh, this, earlier this year over the summer. And I also like amateur radio, uh, which means that I know a bit of Morse code. You can find me on Twitter and send me, send me messages if, if, you, if you really want. Um, there's my handle. Oh yeah, so Josh can't be here because he's flying back to the States, so I, I said I'm happy to talk us through our findings. So malware is a service. Everything is a service now, apparently. So what does this actually mean? Well, it's, it, you know, thinking about it, it's quite a good buzzword um, because it captures um, the growing trend that we've seen in the underground economy. Um, in that we've seen malicious actors increase, increasingly collaborate with one another. And these dependencies or interdependencies have been seen in the growth in hacking, carding, cracking forums, the growth in Discord and Telegram channels and marketplaces. Um, and we, I, I mentioned all of those and we see kind of an ebb and flow between them. So as a marketplace is, say, taken down through a law enforcement action. We see people move to, say, Discord channels. Discord channels are really big right now for sharing information between criminal actors. Um, so, yeah. So, but essentially, malware as a service describes this model um, of criminal actors s selling either their wares or their services to other criminal actors to achieve uh, criminal aims. So this can include bulletproof posting, exploits, and the topic that we're going to really focus on in this presentation is distribution and downloaders. Um, so uh, prominent examples of this model in action is uh, the Gosnime botnet, which was dismantled earlier this year, uh, the Neckers botnet, and Emotet. So there's been a previous body of research into this area. Um, the European Cybercrime Centre has done some really excellent research uh, into this. And so they published in 2015 this dependencies map, um, which just goes to show how many actors are involved in a criminal operation. And then in 2017, the UK's National Cybersecurity Centre, they published a cybercrime business model for a typical banking trojan. And later, we actually expanded on this model. And then in 2018, um, I have to mention this, because he's my colleague as well. Um, Bromian, we, we did some research into um, the growth of the cybercrime economy. Um, and, and Dr. Michael McGuire, he's a, he's a criminologist. Um, and then in 2019, following the takedown of the Gosnheim botnet, uh, EC3 also published some really neat infographics that showed how the operation worked from the inside. So to illustrate this, I have a couple of two case studies. Uh, so the first is Emotet distribution. So I, I'm sure many of you are, are fam very familiar with Emotet. It's hugely pervasive. Um, but just a quick bit of background. Yeah, it was first identified in the wild in 2014 by, I think, Trend Micro researchers. Um, it's highly modular. Originally, it was a banking trojan, um, and it did your standard banking trojan um, uh, theft of man-in-the-browser attacks. Um, but early in 2017, you saw the shift from 
deploying its own banking Trojan module to suddenly distributing other families of malware, typically banking Trojans, so Iced ID, Zeus Panda, and TrickBot. And so that kind of got me thinking, well, what's in it for them? If they're not directly monetizing um, financial information, how are they making money? Um, so it's possible that they're selling access to their botnet infrastructure. Because if you're, say, you know, a bank, if you're, if you're a malware developer, um, you have a banking Trojan, but you still need to distribute your malware. You need someone to host your payload somewhere. You need somebody who knows about how to conduct a phishing campaign on a very large scale. And Emotet already had this down to a T. So this is the kind of business model that we proposed. Um, and it's based, as I say, on the National Cybersecurity Center's original business model, but we've expanded it because the one they developed in 2017 only looked at one single operation. Um, and we feel that with malware as a service, there's this collaboration between different actors. So we want to take that into account. So at the bottom, you can see this, this actor, which could represent Emotet's operators. And then up here, uh, we see um, a banking Trojan that Emotet is known to be distributing, so in this case, TrickBots, for example. And then we see all the actors involved in monetizing financial information. And, and in this case, Emotet is responsible for the distribution of the TrickBot. Um, TrickBot malware, and in this talk, we're going to focus on that target distribution. So, Imatech payloads, they're hosted on compromised web servers. That's very well known. Um, the screenshot is an example of the PHP code server side that's actually hosting the Imatech binary. Um, you can actually find a lot of these dotted around the web quite easily because web hosts, they will scan their customer uh, servers for uh, this Emotet uh, script, and then they'll rename it to something like dot suspicious. Um, so if you do a Google search for index.php dot suspicious, then you'll, you'll come up with loads of web servers that have been compromised in this way. Um, and the Trojan is just hosted as a base64 encoded uh, blob of data. Um, and there's this perception that Emotet, they're mainly hosted on compromised WordPress servers uh, or web, WordPress websites. And, you know, anecdotally, yeah, you can kind of see that in lots of the URLs. You can see WP dash some string. Um, but we wanted to actually confirm that by looking at the data. And, yeah, so what does the data tell us about how Emotet act as a compromising web servers? So we went about collecting data. So we collected um, data. Um, we identified the web servers that were used to distribute Emotet from September 2018 to October 2019, so over a year's worth of data. Uh, sources included our own automated Maldoc analysis, which was both static and dynamic. Um, so on the static front, we had a bunch of Python scripts to manually scrape out any URLs contained in the Maldocs. And then on the dynamic front, we had three different sandboxes. So we had Cookie with Japan certs, uh, Malcomp scan tool for actually extracting the configuration from the Emotet binary uh, from its process memory. Uh, similarly, with Cape, which is another sandbox, uh, Cuckoo fork, and then uh, our own Bromium proprietary sandboxes. Um, we also used public data, so from the CryptoLamus team, who are absolutely amazing. They've, they've done a great job at um, sharing threat information about Immutets. So in total, we collected over 25,000 URLs uh, over that time period. And so it, on average, it's about 65 fresh URLs per day, which is a lot. And you kind of think, well, it's not a good situation if you're just relying on a web proxy to keep up and block all those URLs. So that, that kind of got us thinking. 
And then we wanted to actually enumerate what was running on these web servers. Was, were there any commonalities? So we used what CMS and Shodan's passive um, scans um, to see what was running there. And in total, we, we successfully uh, retrieved data for about 9,000 web servers. Many, many of the web servers were offline, which was kind of to be expected. So here's what we found in terms of the distribution of technologies on these web servers. So the first, um, the first finding is that, of course, well, PHP is the most common technology, and about 95% of these web servers ran it. In fact, I, I reckon it's closer to 100% because, of course, Emotet relies on PHP to actually host the binary. So there is some wiggle room in the data collection there. Um, so it's possible that some of the websites weren't fully scanned or incorrectly scanned. And this 95% figure is interesting because if you compare it to the wider web, um, it's higher than you would expect. So there's this uh, company called W3Techs, and they conduct web technology surveys across the top 10 million uh, ranked uh, websites by Alexa. And uh, as of October 2019, they found about 79% of websites run PHP versus our 95%. The other interesting thing is, OK, there are a lot of websites that run WordPress, in this case, about 87.6%. And then, as you would expect, we also see WordPress dependencies. Um, the data kind of ties up, you, you'd, you'd expect, but um, the dependencies would match or exceed um, the, the popularity of WordPress. And then we also see two uh, WordPress plugins in particular that featured very frequently, so WooCommerce and Elementor. So, okay, so we, we thought, okay, well, let's take a look at the WordPress version distribution. Perhaps um, these WordPress sites are running really out-of-date versions that are prone to compromise. Um, and actually, the data didn't show that at all. So you, as you can see here, over half are running uh, version 5.2.4. And then if you actually look at the release dates, you know, the top four were all released in October this year. And the, from four to eight, they, uh, they were up to a year or so uh, out of date. So it didn't really paint a, um, a clear picture. Um, now, there are a couple of explanations for this. Uh, the first is that it could be an issue with our data collection methodology. So for instance, we collected the data as a snapshot in time. So um, it's possible that um, web host, or so some of these sites have been were compromised over a year ago, so it's possible that the web hosts have again upped, since updated the WordPress versions. However, um, I was really curious about whether that, that was the case. So I've been collecting um, URLs, Umitech URLs, as they've been coming in for the past couple of weeks, and looking at the version distribution, it matches this. So of course, it, we'd, we'd need more data to confirm it, but certainly the distribution looks like this, uh, rather than anything wildly different. Um, the other, well, from that finding, that leads to the, the possibility that, in fact, Emotet's actors aren't directly compromising WordPress then. Um, so what are they compromising? Well, then we took a look at WordPress dependencies and associated technologies, so namely PHP and WordPress plugins. Um, this time, when we looked at the version distribution of PHP, we saw a really wide um, variety of versions in use. And actually, over 61% or 61% were out of support. So yeah, these web servers were really running old versions of uh, PHP. And you can see here, these are the versions which are out of support. And bear in mind, this doesn't include versions which are in a branch which is in support, but are just out of date. So actually, far more web servers are uh, probably 
um, uh, vulnerable. And then looking at the same for the Elementor and WooCommerce plugins, yeah, there were a few cross-site scripting um, exploits or vulnerabilities, uh, but they were limited in scope and it didn't really make sense that they were really going for these because the market share or the proportion of uh, web servers that were running these plugins was still relatively low. Yeah, so PHP represents the largest target for compromised by Emotex operators. So then we went crazy and thought, okay, why don't we look at the data in another way? So we did some network analysis. And the great thing about network analysis is that rather than just looking at the most frequent, um, most frequent um, items or bits of data that, uh, uh, that, uh, that appear, instead you can look at the relationships between nodes and identify, hopefully identify new trends that you might otherwise miss. So apologies for the very small text, but essentially what this is looking at are, uh, so this is a mapped out um, uh, showdown uh, data uh, from the web servers that we obtain data from. And you can see all the applicable CVEs uh, and then the, red, the, red, the very tiny red nodes are the web servers themselves. But the key, the key things to know here is that actually you see two or so clusters, and the first cluster is a cluster of SSH vulnerabilities, and the second cluster is a cluster of PHP vulnerabilities. Um, and actually, if you just looked at the most frequent vulnerabilities, it wouldn't really, it'd be, it'd be, it'd, it'd show you some of the data, but it wouldn't show you the relationships. So it wouldn't tell you, uh, for instance, okay, uh, this web server is running a vulnerable version of SSH, but it's also running Joomla or some other web technology. So then we did kind of a standard uh, look at the most frequent CVEs that popped up. But actually, none of them were really applicable to the aims of Emotet's actors. They were mainly kind of denial of service vulnerabilities or information exposure vulnerabilities. So with all that in mind, here's what we found and what we concluded. So we constructed this continuum of what we feel is the, or what the data suggests is the most likely attack method that Emotex actors are using to, to initially compromise these web servers to host the payload. Um, and it's definitely pointing towards a PHP exploit and possibly password guessing. Um, the unknown at the bottom for MySQL, that's because we weren't able to enumerate the versions of MySQL, um, so I've left it unknown. That could potentially be uh, an attack vector. So let's move on to case study two, OSTAP. So OSTAP is a commodity downloader written in JScript. JScript is an interpreted language, very close relative to JavaScript. I'm not a JavaScript developer myself, but when I asked people, the developers in the office, like, what's the difference between JScript and JavaScript? They basically looked like they were having PTSD, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're, very, they're different. Um, but the key thing is that it actually runs natively on Windows through Windows Script Host. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great candidate for living off the land. Um, so after Emotet went offline, and uh, more on that in a bit, we noticed that Emotet uh, trickbots operators started using other downloaders, including OSTAP. So why is OSTAP a good downloader? Well, okay, this isn't actually a reason why, but it's highly obfuscated. So a typical sample is nearly 35,000 lines. Um, it has some anti-analysis measures built in. So for example, it contains a process and host name blacklist. Um, it has actually relatively low detection rate for script-based malware, so 11% on virus total. Um, and it also includes apologetic messages to researchers. So yeah. Um, okay, so why? So in order to understand the increase in OSTAP activity, we actually have to go back to Emotet. 
Um, so this is a detections over time from April to October for Ematech. This is actually from one network. So this isn't across all Bromian customers, but it's representative. And we can see at uh, late May, mail spam activity from Ematech pauses, and then we see this kind of dip. And then at the beginning or mid-September, we see the resumption of mail spam activity. So what about over the summer? What, what are TrickBot's operators going to do? Well, they could be looking for alternative downloaders because Ematech's not serving up and distributing their malware. Uh, so that's why we saw an increase in OSTAP. Um, so as I mentioned, OSTAP actually uh, contains some anti-analysis measures, which makes it more complicated to to, to analyze and simply running it in a sandbox and relying on dynamic um, analysis. Um, in the samples that, you know, in many samples that I came across in public sandboxes, I won't name names, um, oftentimes they wouldn't communicate with the server hosting TrickBot. Um, yeah. So actually we have to rely on deobfuscating the malware ourselves um, so I followed this four-stage approach, beautification, identifying the code structure, key functions in there, um, taking a closer look at the character code calculation functions, and then just automating it with Python, because 35,000 lines of JScript is, would take a long time to go through manually. Um, and then here on, oh, over here you can see the, uh, the blacklist. Um, kind of found it funny that they include Mueller PC as well, um, maybe named after Robert Mueller. Who knows? So first, um, I beautified the sample that uh, I used to construct a tool uh, to automate deobfuscation of OSTAP. Um, so there's a JS beautifier tool, which also works with JScript. And so you go from um, the maldoc, which simply contains the J script, which is written to a file, but it's all on a single line, to something a bit more readable. So the second step is to identify the structure and just kind of remove any junk uh, you can see. Um, so actually, you can tell pretty clearly what's been generated by an obfuscator and what hasn't. So in this case, you can see that the obfuscator kind of followed the standard kind of AM, U, Z, and then, or E, and then some kind of dictionary word, and then all, all of that's junk. The, the only important uh, variable is down there, Gunster. And um, through kind of removing all the junk, we're left with the good stuff. And um, always a good sign is that if it's referenced elsewhere, so in this case, Gunster is referenced over 2,500 times, so it's likely that it's used um, substantially in the script. So it, as it turns out, um, despite being 35,000 lines long, it just is, is, is basically a bit of arithmetic plus uh, from char code, um, which is a method which converts from a Unicode character code into a character. Um, so uh, basically, it was just a, a matter of um, finding that particular deobfuscation function, um, just simplifying it, and um, yeah, then automating it. So here's the approach I took for automating it in Python. As it turns out, the character code value is always found in the same two indices of an array. Uh, for example, 0 and 1. And then these are supplied into the deobfuscation function. So it was, it, it was actually it, it was fairly straightforward to just write a script that would um, just obtain those uh, elements and then put them into lists and then clean them up a bit and then do the arithmetic as defined in, in, the, in the function and then print the result. So here's the script that came out of this uh, research. It's, if, if anyone's interested in it, it's, it's on my GitHub page. Um, 
yeah, people, in, people kind of tweet, tweet at me and say, oh, it doesn't work. I mean, I look, I, I, I look at it in my spare time and I fix it. And, and yeah, I've been fairly good at that. Um, so I, I appreciate any, any feedback. And yeah, if you find it useful. So uh, this was kind of the end result of after deobfuscating uh, all of those OSAP samples, it allowed us to identify the uh, servers used to host uh, TrickBot in this case. So here we can see uh, this campaign, as I mentioned, occurred from over the summer when Emotet was offline or maybe they were on holiday, uh, so from July to August. And the red, small red nodes represent unique OSAP samples. And then the uh, yellow nodes represent the web servers hosting the TrickBot binary. And then the big red node in the middle is actually the autonomous system. Um, in this case, net name King Servers is, is, fairly, is a well-known bulletproof um, hosting provider. So our conclusion, what can we conclude? Well, like any economy, as it grows, uh, new opportunities will be created for criminals to make money from selling their services and their wares to other criminals. Uh, that's, in a nutshell, what malware as a service is. Um, and malware as a service has overall reduced the barrier to entry to cybercrime because it's now easier than ever before to outsource missing capabilities such as malware distribution. So in, in the case studies I showed you, um, TrickBot, they previously used Emotet to distribute their malware, and then they, over the summer, when they didn't have that capability, they switched to another uh, provider, so OSAP. But it also represents some opportunities for um, law enforcement because of the increased interdependencies. Rather than having to build your capabilities in-house and keep a very close, um, tight network of associates, you can just outsource different parts of your operations to people, and that means you're more exposed, uh, potentially, to disruption by law enforcement. It's an exciting area of research, and um, I hope you found the talk interesting. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Great. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex.